I'm Serena Fazan, taking a risk, making a difference, and changing the course of your life. Remarkable stories from people defying the odds. You're listening to On the Record. Hi, everyone. I'm Serena Fazan, a journalist, producer, and the host of On the Record. Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast episode. I'm here with Doug Smith, and we're ready to go on the record. Let's get started. (laughs) Doug, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you, Serena. It's good seeing you again. So Doug is one of my mentors, for sure. We worked (laughs) together a long, long time ago. Doug, you've won how many Emmys? Uh, Nine Emmys. Nine Emmys. Those are regional Emmys. So we don't want to play them up too much. Like he's so, okay, can we please put modesty aside? No, but honestly, you have won nine Emmys and one of, with one of those Emmys, you actually got a man freed from prison. I mean, what an emotional case. Can you talk about that case? Sure. I mean, this is, um, so I had two stints in local television here in Tampa. I know you know, but. Perhaps not everybody is this familiar with my career, so I'll back up. No, for a and we second. have a na- we have a national audience. In fact, this podcast goes as far as Ireland and Canada, <laughs> according to our analytics. So please, yeah. let people know. <laughs> <laughs> well, does that mean I need to use my Irish accent? Ooh, no, I don't have, have one. one. If you had I'm, one, I'm that'd just be great. Kidding. So I worked in in local television. I've been in television for 25 years. Uh, officially retired in 2015, um, and and I spent some time out in California. I was at KCRA out there in Sacramento. I was in Monterey. I was in Las Vegas. I was in Tampa, Orlando, and Tamp- back to Tampa. So we worked together at Channel 28, which is the ABC affiliate in Tampa, and we worked together for a number of different years, and I was the weekend anchor, and I was a special projects reporter there and general assignment. Uh, And then I went to Orlando for a little while and worked in news management with one of my mentors, Bob Jordan. And I came back to Tampa as the investigative reporter. And the reason I wanted to do investigative reporting is when I was a news manager, I I, I saw just how transformational and, and how you could really have an impact through investigative reporting. So I was in charge of running the unit uh, at W uh, uh, FTV in Orlando channel nine. And then I had an opportunity to come back to Tampa and my, you know, we, my family's from here. I mean, mm-hmm. I have my, my boys grew up here and, you know, we, we never really burned the ships when we went over to Orlando. So when I had an opportunity to come back at t- to Tampa in 2003, we took it. And I signed on as the investigative reporter at the Fox station uh, in Tampa, Fox 13, Mm -hmm. which is one of the better local stations in all of the country. And Phil Metlin was the news director. And he said, we really want to focus on investigative reporting and and how we can affect change in our community and right some of the wrongs. And I thought, this is great. And it was it was tremendous. So I had an opportunity. It was myself and we had a producer, Lisa Blagan, and a dedicated photographer, editor, Craig Davison. It was an opportunity to really do some impacting and meaningful stories. So Jean-Claude Muse, what, mm-hmm. why did you want to start looking into that case and give people um, an idea about that case? Yeah. Uh, That was one of the, certainly one of the more uh, memorable stories that I did throughout my quarter century in broadcasting. And Jean-Claude Muse is a Haitian immigrant who was a truck driver. You know, he still is a truck driver, actually. And in, uh, you know, 2003, he was driving his truck uh, through the middle of the state, carrying a load of tomatoes through Wachula. And Wachula is out in Hardy County. So that's kind of one of the counties that this market serves, but it's certainly very rural and very remote. And, uh, What's the population of Wachula? Do you know? Oh my I mean, gosh! Yeah, you know, not an exact number, but it, just to paint the town, as you said, it's very, it's rural. It's yeah, remote. I mean, you know, you're you're going to count people in terms of you know thousands instead of tens of thousands. Mm-hmm. I know that, um, and it is very sparsely populated, but it's a very close knit community. I mean, there's great people out in Wachula, and Jean Claude Muse was driving uh, his r- rig. Uh, he picked up a, a load of tomatoes in Immokalee, and he was driving through what's called Seven Mile Point, which is uh, a kind of a, a hairpin turn in Wachula. And um, his story was that, you know, as he was making and negotiating the turn, another car cut him off and he swerved to avoid that car, lost control of his truck and it rolled over onto uh, a van. And there was a mother, Nona Moore, with her three daughters coming home from the mall. And the way that the truck was situated, it, it essentially crushed the van on one side. So the, the, you know, the, the driver, Nona Moore, the mother, and one of her daughters in the, in the back seat, they both were killed instantly in the accident. And I think the daughter was only eight years old. Yeah, she was. The one, she the was, one Lindsay. Died. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so then the other two little girls um, were, were spared. 
and they were on the other side of the van. And so Jean-Claude immediately got out and he tried to render assistance, but it was pretty clear that, uh, that this was a really a tragic accident. And, and that's what it really was, was it was a tragic accident. I mean, sometimes he, there was no drugs, there was no alcohol. And, and unfortunately, sometimes people die and it is an accident. And sometimes people die and it is negligence. But the Florida Highway Patrol charged him with two counts of vehicular homicide with the idea that somehow he was he was reckless. And the jury convicted him in, in 45 minutes because they loved Nona and they loved uh, Lindsay. And they just, they, everybody thought that, you know, that was, that was the right thing, I believe, in that community. And they just didn't think about this, you know, this, this poor Haitian truck driver, Jean-Claude, who's very educated, very, very- Five sweet, languages he yes, spoke. five languages, very sweet man. Um, and, uh, they, they, he went, he went to prison. So we got involved in the story when Nona's two sisters, uh, Dana, um, uh, and Beth decide they, they had a chance encounter with Jean-Claude while he was still out, um, you know, before, th- and, and, and they, they realized, the yeah, I think it was, yes, it was before the trial that he was just a really a good person. And they thought, you know what? I mean, um, you know, Nona was, was a really strong Christian. She believed in forgiveness and sh- they believed that she would not want him in prison. And this was nothing more than an accident. And really what resonated about the story is anybody can have an accident. I mean, I can be driving and someone can cut me off and I can swerve and there might be somebody driving in the bike lane and, and something unforeseen would happen. You shouldn't go to prison for an accident. And it was pretty clear that this was, you know, that, that because he didn't have any power and influence and because he was an outsider, he was an immigrant from Haiti, from Haiti, that he wasn't being treated fairly. But it was really the sisters. It was, it was uh, Dana and Beth that came to us and said, we've called the state attorney. We've called anybody we can. We don't think he deserves to be in prison. So then we started this, looking. It, this just gives me goosebumps because yeah. these are sisters. Yeah. Of the victim. Yeah. Of the victim in this case. And that was really the turning point in our initial story. And and I'll give you the link. So if any of anybody that's listening to this wants to Absolutely. see the story. Absolutely. I mean, I started, can, I watched it and it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, a lot of people worked hard on it. Um, we'll add the links okay. to the web article sure. that is on this podcast so people sure. can watch it. And I would encourage them to do so. But please continue. Yeah. It, so that they believe that Jean-Claude Muse did not deserve to be in prison and so when we put that story on the air, that was exactly the powerful moment that resonated with our viewers, Serena. It's when they, when the, when, when the two sisters said, we don't think he deserves to be in prison. We, we don't want him there. We know it was an accident. We know that no one would have forgiven him. And that was really the turning point. We said, well, we're going to put this story on the air. But it's one thing to, to be able to you know, know you're right and to show you're right and to have those emotions. But to prove you're right in a court of law took another two and a half years. And wow. so you fast forward 26 stories later in two and a half years, and the battle we went through showing the flawed FHP diagram, a witness that they never interviewed, and then finally in the end, you know, Jean-Claude Muse was released from prison, which was probably, you know, the, the single most greatest accomplishment of, of my journalistic career. You know, and I wanted to ask you, I mean, seriously, I have goosebumps all over. (laughs) You were actually there when he was released. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So describe to me what that was like to us. People, it's been five years since I left um, local television as an investigative reporter. And people often ask me, they'd say, you know, what do you miss most about it? And some people would think, oh, you miss the, you miss the lights. You miss the, you know, the being involved in a fight and that sort of thing. And, and I really thought about that, and I came up with what I think is the right answer for me, at least. I don't know what it is for anybody else, but the best part for me about being an investigative reporter was I got to help people, and I didn't ask for anything in return. And so it was just this idea that somehow I could fight for what's right, and the station would pay me my salary to be able to go out there and to fight for people that otherwise wouldn't have a voice. And especially today, you know, when you see it, I mean, you know, Jean-Claude Muse is a very dark Haitian man. And so a couple of the pieces that we did were, were called Justice Black and White. And we showed the contrast of Jean-Claude Muse's accident, and he got, you know, 15, 15 years, years in prison. And we showed another truck driver, um, you know, who was from Georgia, 
who had a very similar accident around the same time period, but instead of you know offering help, when he smashed into the back of a big rig, he actually tried to take off, had a, a couple prior DUIs, and the same agency that investigated Jean Claude Muse investigated you know this truck driver and decided that he deserved nothing more than a traffic ticket. And there was such a disparity there that we said, how on earth could you make this case? And so we put that to the viewers and people were outraged. And we had, you know, a number of people that, that, that wrote emails and said, you know, this is this just isn't right. I mean, clearly this man, you know, on, on the basis of him, him not having, you know, privilege and power and him, you know, because of the color of his skin, did, just did not get a fair trial. Uh, and what so that's a long way of answering your question. No, which but was, we how appreciate. Did, but we appreciate how did, the how did long I answer. feel when he got out? I really, I, I just, it, it's hard to describe. I felt like, I mean, it wasn't me. It was there was a whole team of people that worked hard to be able for that moment, and to know that when you fight for what's right and you don't give up and you don't take no and you push and you push and you push. And you you confront what I call truth challenged people. Those are liars. <laughs> uh, that in the end, you know, you you can make a difference, and you can look at a man who otherwise would be wasting away at taxpayers' expense in prison, who's out and earning a living, and he's a truck driver again, and he's he's had the most remarkable life since because we've kept in touch. That's when you're like, man, what is that the greatest job in the world, or or what? And I and I love that. Doug, but if you guys had not gotten involved, yeah. and this is the power of the media, mm -hmm. especially when you work at a very strong station like yeah. like Fox 13 in yeah. Tampa, um, he could still be sitting in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he, and and he knows that, and he, um, but again, it was you know it wasn't just Doug Smith. There was a team of people. Uh, the news director believed in the story. At least the and my producer believed in the story. You know, Craig Davis and the photographer was was there. Um, our, our station attorney, I mean, we really had a lot of people behind us saying we need to do more. I mean, we did, you know, 26 stories over two and a half years. I mean, who, who does that, um, for this one man, for a one man who, you know, didn't deserve to be in prison. And you wonder how many more Jean-Claude Muses are out there. And, and the answer is probably a lot, but we didn't always get the outcome that we wanted. And honestly, I didn't know it would turn out that way, Serena. I mean, if you, you know, when we started, you know, we just kind of started peeling back the, the layers of the onion and and it ended up that uh, that it worked out that way. Did his legal team and was John Trevina yeah, the attorney? John Trevina. Mm -hmm. John Trevina behind that legal team. Did the legal team take your stories and present them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, uh, talk, just, so walk us through that process. Well, I've done. A, I, John and I have a long relationship uh, going back, you know, years before the Jean Claude Muse case, and um, and we'd done a number of stories. You know, John is a, a, a talented and colorful attorney, bigger than life, that would take on uh, stories. I remember a story that he did uh, uh, about a guy that was wearing a ball cap in in one of the convenience stores, and it said LAPD on it. And this guy was arrested for impersonating an officer, oh, and it was it was ridiculous. And John showed how ridiculous it was. In fact, I remember we called LAPD <laughs> and said, "What do you think of this?" And they said, "We wish there were more people <laughs> like him." Because instead of saying, you know, "F the police," right. <laughs> they, were, they were wearing They're... they were wearing something. So. Um, John did that story, and we worked on a number of different uh, cases together. So when this one came up, um, I think what attracted both of us to the story was this idea that it was just a simple accident, and anybody can have an accident. And then the forgiveness that was extended by the sisters was really a, a, just a, a, something that you just normally don't see. And I, I believe they really are the true heroes of the story. Um, and and so we worked on that story uh, for a while, and I, I you know I said. Uh, at, at the end of it all, it's one thing to to know you're right. It's another to show you're right. But to prove you're right in a court of law uh, is is a very difficult task. And John was very skilled along the way. And, and really, I think, um, you know, it was his legal talent and his uh, ability, you know, to continue fighting and not to give up. Because I can tell you there were times when it looked like there were there were really dead ends. I'll give you one example, Serena. Um, 
we were about in the middle of the story and we knew that John was submitting our stories as evidence. Mm -hmm. And we knew that the judge was watching it as well. There was a couple, it was the second DCA. It went through a couple different jurisdictions. And I knew this because I talked to the clerk and, you know, the clerks are always very friendly. And so I knew the judge was watching our stories. And I knew that as we turned overturned more evidence, like a faulty FHP diagram, like a witness that was never interviewed and these things that eventually the the District Court of Appeal might grant him a new trial. And so John Wilson, who's the longtime anchor at Fox 13, who has since retired, uh, said to me that asked me that question, well, what does the you know, what does the court think of all of this? And I said, well, I know that that they're watching our stories and that the um, you know, that it's been submitted as evidence. Many of the stories on VHS tape, mm-hmm. remember those? Yes. <laughs> were submitted so long ago. were submitted as evidence. And uh and, and so I answered the question. And I thought nothing of it. You just, okay, right. it seems innocuous mm-hmm. enough, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that seemingly innocent comment almost blew the whole the whole story and the whole the whole opportunity for us to free him because the court from that point on made it their mission to say, wait a minute, we're not being directed by local television. So the fact that we pointed out that the judge was watching it, then there was a series of really disfavorable rulings on our part because I think that they went out of their way to be able to show that the court is independent of journalism. We're not watching this, and and I knew the judge was watching it, and and I don't I don't I didn't say that we were influencing him. You but, were just saying that they were watching but the report. That seemingly innocuous comment, I think, almost uh, almost did us in. Honestly, yeah. So there was a lot of, you know, twists and turns along the way, uh, uh, you know, in the Jean-Claude Muse. And in fact, you know. Well, before uh, you tell us more about it, let's go to a break because we want to hear what's happening now with Jean-Claude Muse because there's some, there's some, a new chapter, I guess I should say. So we'll be right back. There's Serena's tease. New (laughs) chapter after a break. (laughs) This podcast is brought to you by Autism Shifts kind of used to seeing autism through um, you know the net the lens of its challenges you know everything that's hard about it and what we've been able to do through our program and me as a mom I've been able to shift that perspective and start looking at the whole diagnosis differently and when I do I can see the capabilities I can see the possibilities for our community and really that's the opportunity we have is to help People within our community see that. For more information, visit autismshifts.org. So welcome back to On the Record. I'm here with Doug Smith, and I'm a multi-Emmy award-winning journalist, and we're talking about the Jean-Claude Muse case where uh, a Haitian man went to prison for 15 years for causing an accident, and th- Doug, through his investigative work with your team, I know you also you know, credit the team, actually got him freed yeah. from prison. So... Yeah, well, you, you were just about to tell us something. Um, I was, wasn't I? <laughs> well, well, it was really interesting. We were talking about we were talking about sure. the comment that you you know that was very innocent yeah. about the judge watching some of your stories, yeah. and it yeah. may have resulted in some unfavorable rulings yeah. at that point. There certainly were setbacks all along the way, and you know. What I used to always say about investing, um, investigative reporting is you can't script the ending. I mean, you don't, if I were to tell you that I knew in the end that we weren't going to stop until he was free from prison, you know, I, you know, I would be another truth challenged person because I didn't know. I don't think anybody knew how it was going to turn out. You just, you know, what you do is you, you, you just follow the leads. And in this case, we just kept following the leads and we would uncover one piece of information and another piece of information until finally we got to the point where we thought that, you know what, there's enough here uh, that we should have, you know, that the court would be compelled to have another ruling to, to, to look at the evidence and determine whether or not this conviction should be vacated. And that's what they do. They vacate it. And then the district attorney has to decide if they're going to, you know, bring it up and retry it. And we, one of the things that I, I failed to mention earlier is we went, we, we tracked down some of the jurors in the case and we talked with them and we said, you know, knowing all this information now, do you think that you would have come back in 45 minutes and, and convicted this man? And they said, no, we, look, you know, somebody was dead and, and, you know, we thought somebody had to pay for it and go to prison, you know, and again, this idea that sometimes tragic things happen and it's nothing more than a tragic accident. 
And that's really, you know, was what was at the what was at the crux of it. But there was a lot of twists and turns, you know, when we found the, you know, the disparity. Uh, one of the lead investigators went to high school with one of the victims and did not recuse himself. I mean, if you watch the story, and what we did is we did a, a documentary that ran up against Monday Night Football, and it did incredible ratings. Um, and, and we knew at that point that this was really a story that this community cared about. Because I, as I told you, Serena, I've, I've been out five years now. I run my own advertising mm-hmm. agency. And people, if they come up to me and they, they recognize me, um, and, and if they talk about anything, it will be that story. It will be the story that we called small town justice or now what we've called it is justice black and white because clearly, you know, we, we know that, and that was one of the chapters. So, um, the, in, in this time, we realize that re, the retelling of this story may have some, uh, healing effect for, for all of us. So uh, we've taken the story, uh, myself and my producer, and we've put it into a book form and we've submitted a book proposal. And at the same time, um, some Hollywood script writers have said, you know what, we, we want to, we want to tell this story, uh, with some people, some names that you would know. Um, but Can I'm you not, share those uh, names. <laughs> You're not a liberty yet. You're not, a, it's off the record. It's, not, off, the re- it's off the record. Aren't right those now. great TV terms? It's off the record. I'm not at Liberty's the lawyer one. Uh, yeah, all those things above, but uh, it's exciting because I do think that this would be a great story for people to hear because it's such a story of faith and forgiveness and such a story of hope. And Jean-Claude Muse, when he got out of prison, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. Remember I told you I never knew how the story was going to mm-hmm, turn out. Mm-hmm. I used to say, we're not, you know, we're not, this isn't, we're not making music videos. You know, I mean, we can't like, oh, here's the video, yeah. here's, and here's how it ends. Mm-hmm. We couldn't do that. We didn't know how the ending was going to turn out. This was a terrific ending. But I, I knew when he got out that he was never going back. And he, after he got out, uh, he he went back and he visited some folks in Haiti. And then he got himself a truck. And now he's out driving again. And has not even had so much as a traffic ticket. Wow. Um, you know, and, and he's a productive member of society. And I've seen him two or three times. And, you know, we still talk occasionally. Um, and I, I just think his story is such a great story of inspiration that in a country that is that is really so divided by racial issues that this is one of those that would, I think, is uniting. And, and if people saw it, they would, it, it would, it, it, it's a great story. Absolutely. Especially in the time that we're living in right now. Yeah. Because, you know, you talk when you, when you said it's about faith and forgiveness, of course, because mm-hmm. Jean-Claude could have so much anger. Yeah. Do you see that he does not, he's at, he's actually able to put the past behind him? Yeah. I really believe that, that he is just based on the way that he's lived his life since he, you know, since he got out of prison. I mean, you know, we did what well, we first started doing the stories in, you know, 2000, I mean, 2003, it happened. He got out in 2008. So what, here we are in, you know, 2020. So, you know, you're looking at 12 years and, you know, he's, he's, he's been a model citizen and it would have been such a shame for him to waste all of those years, you know, locked up. Um, and, uh, he's just, you know, he's, he's been, he's been great. And, uh, he's a friend of mine. And that's, that's the other great part is that, you know, you, you have these relationships and these friendships that kind of last a lifetime. And I, I, I still have some of them from the other stories, but mm-hmm. certainly this story is, is, uh, is the one that special. hits. Yeah. Is the one that you, yeah, I, I really, you, one of the things we were able to do is in 2000 and, uh, late 2008, uh, we won a number of awards for the story our team did. And we got word that we won a, uh, a, a DuPont award. It's Columbia DuPont Silver Baton. Can okay. you explain that to some people who may not know? Because it is such, it is more prestigious than an yeah. Emmy award. Yeah. Um, Your mom likes the Emmys. And yeah. when I have all the Emmys on the shelf, she goes, I know what those are. But in journalism, there's, you know, there's a, there's the DuPont award, there's the Peabody award. Um, there are, there are certain uh, journalistic awards that, you know, within the journalistic community are, are pretty revered and the DuPont Columbia is one of them. And they, they get, you know, hundreds of entries all over the country and there's seven or eight, maybe not. And I think, well, actually I take that back. I think there's 13 that are awarded silver batons. The number varies from year to year. And that is the uh, broadcast journalistic equivalent of the Pulitzer prize. Mm-hmm. 
So it's given by Columbia University in New York in the Lowe Library, uh, same place where they give the, the, the newspapers the Pulitzer. And so there's, a, there's what's called a DuPont jury, and they review all the different you know, um, bodies of work that are submitted that year. And they looked at ours, and they deemed that it was going to be worthy. And they tell you that, uh, that you know, you've been awarded it, and then the award ceremony is about a month later. So what we were able to do is I was able to uh, get Jean-Claude and, uh, and his fiancée, Rebecca, a plane ticket to be there with us. So oh. here's Jean Claude in the Low Library at Columbia University in Ivy League School in Manhattan, with you know Katie Couric was the one who was emceeing it from you know NBC, and you had Christine Amanpour, and you had the presidents of networks, and Al Gore was in the audience because he was running True TV at the time, and and or one of one of the networks that he has. So and and all the presidents of the various ABC, NBC, CBS, you know, David Muir was there. Um, you know, anybody that was anybody really mm -hmm. goes to this particular event. And so uh, I was able to get up there and accept the award on behalf of our team, which was really really special for me. And then uh, I said, you know, had 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 everybody not done what they did, then um, Jean Claude Muse would still be in prison, and he would not be here with us tonight. And they turned on the house lights and he stood up and it was just a really, it was a great moment. It's just a lot of fun. And I want people to know who are listening and watching this, that we are going to attach the link okay. to that documentary that you did, mm -hmm. the special. It It's so, so, so well done. And you're so, it, you're so well deserving yeah. and your team of every single, you know, award. Before we close out the podcast, this is such a valuable lesson to learn. You are also, and it's hard to imagine, that you're you and your wife, happily married, yeah. three amazing boys. I can't believe you're a grandfather, I've got to say. <laughs> oh, my gosh. For people who are watching, I know clearly, right? You can't yeah. believe he's actually a grandfather as well. Um, what lesson, what type of lesson, though, would you give, like, young kids, young adults about persevering? I mean, you have persevered so yeah. much through your career. You've changed careers. Mm -hmm. Again, you own your own ad ad agency now. And, I, and I'm going to invite you back onto another podcast okay. talking about inspirational stories. But sure. what what advice would you give? You know, I always tell I always, always tell my boys, just fight for what's right and never, never get tired of doing the right thing. Um, and as I said, I was just privileged for so many years to be, have somebody else pay me so I could help other people. And, I, and that's it. It's really, it's a spirit of service. I mean, you know, we can, you can earn all the money in the world, but when you're able to actually impact a life, make a difference and serve someone else, I don't think there's anything better. Do you think investigative journalism like that can be done now, of course, it's done on a national scale, yeah. but as far as on a local scale, we have seen TV really change. And I don't mean to say that in any negative way because we love we love our careers. We love being yeah. a journalist, but it just seems that we don't do that type of work anymore on a local scale. Yeah, we, I mean, we talked a lot about this story. I don't think in 2020 that that would have happened. I guess that's probably the simplest way for me to put it. Um, I think there's real value to investigative reporting, but the amount of time, energy, and effort that it takes is is enormous. And you know, you're paying you know people to essentially, you know, do a lot of work, and what shows up on air is something you know rather small. And uh, it's hard for a station to dedicate those kinds of resources, or a newspaper to dedicate those kinds of resources. Everybody loves investigative journalism, but it's the hardest and the most expensive to produce. And consequently, that's why you don't see a lot of good investigative reporting. But we can clearly see how investigative reporting can certainly change lives oh, and can. make a difference. It has the power to do that because it has the power to shine a, a, a spotlight or a flashlight on an injustice. And then those things, good people get behind it and they start snowballing and then it, it makes a difference. And uh, everybody wants to be a, a part of that. And uh, I was fortunate that I, that I was able to do that for you know, 11 and a half years. How soon could we see the book on, on uh, Jean-Claude Muse or even a potential movie? What do you think? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> gosh, th these things are so out of my realm and out of my control that 
Uh, I don't even know. I mean, you know, I mean, I'd like to say, ah, oh, Serena, six months. I'd like to say a year. I don't, I just, I don't know. But I know that we're going to, we keep, you know, plugging along. Um, and uh, I, I think, I think one day this story will be told to a larger audience. And it was great for me. I mean, I haven't talked about it in a long time, so I probably should have prepared better. <laughs> no, you were great. <laughs> but thank you. Were you. Absolutely, thank thank no. you for, talk, for, for inviting me here so we could talk about it. No, and thank you so much for being here. And that thank brings you. us to the end of another episode of On the Record. Thank you so much, Doug Smith, for sharing sure. your story. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. You can follow me on all my social media platforms. And you can subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. Until next time, stay safe.